Who would win in a fight? Me, 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 or no, no. la 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 la. <laughs> no, that's a bad question. <laughs> that's a horrible question. I, I have an actual question for you guys. Why did Harry Potter end up with Cho Chang in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix? Did he? What do you mean end up? Because everybody knows Harry Potter always gets the snitch. Uh, <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, dude. <laughs> she totally ratted them dude, out. But he like he hated getting that oh. snitch. Still had to do it. He did. <laughs> it's his job. <laughs> But in the book, it was Cho Chang's best friend who ratted them out. No, but he was still mad at Cho in the book. He was mad at everyone in the book all the time. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's personality just changed, just flipped for the fifth book. Like, yeah. Harry's just insane. Cho is just insane. <laughs> yes, he's so weird. <laughs> uh, yeah, I will say, when I read the fifth book, I was like, these people are insane. This doesn't make any sense. Like, I stopped reading the series as a kid because I hated the fifth book so much. And when I watched the fifth movie, I was like oh they have like legitimate reasons for being angry Voldemort. like someone just died and they're grieving and also you know they're getting older and harry is maybe possessed by voldemort and so this is a really good movie that i think that it managed to make what was kind of un it didn't make sense to me in the book make perfect sense to me in the movie hello and welcome to the popcorn isn't real i'm leif eric i'm here with my brother torvald yeah that's me and my sister brita hi Today, we are continuing our epic breakdown of the entire Harry Potter franchise. We're doing what we always do. We're talking about <laughs> Harry Potter. Harry Potter. <laughs> That's it's all our we favorite. ever do. We're a Harry Potter <laughs> podcast. We got our first bad review from Harry Potter. <laughs> yes, <laughs> wow. Yeah, someone gave us one, one star, star on Apple Podcasts. We're podcast. pretty sure it, it was, was Alfonso Cuaron, yeah. Because oh, it's right after right we right released after the third band. He <laughs> 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 <It> was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> 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 I, I saw guys. that one star review and I I was like, they didn't even say why. No, they That's didn't even so say rude. a thing. But if it's Alfonso That's Corona, he can't say, I get it. He can't deny it, Alfonso. He knows <laughs> yeah. it's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, come at us, Alfonso. I would be Alfonso. so happy you. if Alfonso Cuaron listened to our podcast and gave us <laughs> gave a one-star one, review. one one-star review. Oh, I bet he did. <laughs> you better be happy then, because he certainly did. It was totally him. <laughs> Today we're going to be covering a plethora of the most major and most uh, heavily impacting Harry Potter theories, including the theory that Ron cast the Imperious Curse on Hermione. What? He was fed up with his role of a worthless sidekick and decided to take matters into his own hands and win the woman of his dreams, or I guess the woman that he always hated <laughs> um, with some sort of revenge. I don't know. <laughs> he just wants power over her. We're also covering the theory that Hagrid was a Death Eater, that he was working for Lord Voldemort the entire time. Furthermore, we believe that Snape was Harry's father. Whoa. And he knew it all along, and throughout the movies he was trying to reconnect with Harry, despite his unbelievably lacking social situational awareness <laughs> social <abilities>. skills <laughs> <laughs> and the the final major theory that we're going to cover today is that dumbledore was a dark wizard who was trying <laughs> to amass an army to take <laughs> on the ministry of magic and overthrow the minister of magic you're gonna have to work hard to convince me there's any evidence for that in <laughs> no. this movie <laughs> no 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 definitely not <laughs> So trigger warning, if perhaps you like Ron Weasley, or you really love Dumbledore, or you really or love Hagrid. Hagrid, or you really hate Snape, hate Snape. or your <laughs> name is Alfonso Cuaron. <laughs> I don't think we're going to attack Alfonso Cuaron again. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not. We might be saying some bad things about your favorite characters. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but thanks so much for listening. <laughs> the music was provided by Christine. By Christine. <laughs> Yeah. And remember, <laughs> the popcorn <laughs> is <isn't> done real. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Sorry. Wrap it up. Best episode yet. <laughs> this week, I just got back from London and I went to Whoa. the Harry Potter studio tour Whoa. in ah. London. Oh my gosh. Oh Whoa. my gosh. Well, I bet they had its most iconic locations. Like They did. Gringotts. <laughs> Gringotts. Wow. Yes. They had Gringotts. <laughs> Everyone's Gringotts. the most iconic <laughs> location in Harry Potter. They had both like good, you know, highly functional Gringotts where, you know, everything's nice and bright and cheery. And then they had another Gringotts set oh, that was broken whoa. Gringotts after it gets like <laughs> ransacked by Harry Potter and his mischievous friends After in the, the dragon, dragon runs rampage yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. in the seventh movie. Dude, wow. and the dragon showed up and breathed fire oh. at us. It was so oh, scary. No. Oh, how oh, did you gosh. survive? <laughs> I saw Alan Rickman's wig. I saw Lucius Malfoy's <laughs> wig. I saw Hermione's <laughs> wig. I saw so oh. many wigs. <laughs> There's all kinds of wigs. <laughs> exactly what I wanted to see. So this movie, it starts out in Little Winging. Number four, Privet Drive, in the first movie, was a real house that they filmed in. But that was too difficult. So for all the other movies, they rebuilt the entire neighborhood as just facades. But they had number four and number three pivot drive set up. I've been there. I went up to the door. That door had no knob. <laughs> so like you oh, couldn't no. even get in. <laughs> and wow. the mail slot, I, I love this detail. The mail slot was completely inoperable, which is, of <laughs> course, because Vernon nailed it shut to prevent the Hogwarts <laughs> acceptance letters from coming yeah. in. No so more I was mail. like, good detail there. Perfect. It's not because it's a fake door. <laughs> or because they don't want letters. fans just like shoving stuff in there. <laughs> Whoa, dude, I would totally shove acceptance letters in there for Harry. <laughs> don't worry, Harry. I got Wouldn't you. We all? I got you. I got you, man. <laughs> no, you no one lets I tell words. him. Because <laughs> I'm so delusional. I somehow know what happens before. Books, but don't think that they've happened in I real life, but are going yet. to happen in real life. <laughs> Even though the books were set like in the past. So in the <laughs> 90s, yeah. Confused. <laughs> I did want to talk briefly about the scene where the boys are bullying Harry. Dudley starts, you know, making fun of him about Cedric's death, and Harry's understandably very upset. And so he draws his wand to threaten Dudley. And all of Dudley's friends start like laughing, like, this is hilarious. He's threatening you with a stick, as Dudley's very afraid because he knows it's a wand. But like, it really looks like Harry's just about to gouge his throat like out. Knife. I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like with a shiv. Like, they shouldn't be like laughing. Like, supposedly he goes to St. Brutus's secure center for incurably right. criminal boys. Like, <laughs> yeah. he, oh, wow. <laughs> like they should be. <laughs> Legitimately afraid, regardless of magic. Is that a real place? <laughs> or did they no. just make that up? <laughs> so I have to say, I really, really appreciate Dudley's actor's performance here. Yeah, I yeah, think this is the first great. time he gets to like show his chops. He is a very good British hooligan. <laughs> He's really good at just <laughs> being this. He's dead, Harry. <laughs> He's so good at it, dude. <laughs> He's <laughs> dead. <laughs> dead, Harry. <laughs> Where is your mom? <laughs> <laughs> so good, man. I think the peak of his acting comes after the Dementor attack when they're walking back <laughs> together and Harry is carrying and he has, Dudley. He has Harry in a headlock, headlock and is yeah. pulling Harry <laughs> along like a zombie as Harry no struggles to not Harry get pulled along. Dudley, Dudley <laughs> is walking and he needs Harry in a headlock for emotional support. <laughs> Daniel Radcliffe is like five foot four or something. <laughs> yeah. He's supposedly carrying this and Dudley is British huge. hooligan. <laughs> He's massive. <laughs> oh, oh man, that was scene. a good scene. <laughs> so this movie starts with Harry having a really, really bad day. Not only is he bullied by Dudley, but then he has to defend Dudley from Dementors. Then he's expelled from Hogwarts. And then, while he's having a traumatic flashback about the night Cedric died... The door opens and who shows up but the guy who murdered Cedric. Oh, Mad Eye right. Moody. <laughs> oh, no. Like he would that would not be a joy. Oh, Mad Eye Moody, you're here. That's the guy who that. traumatized you moments ago. Moody didn't murder Cedric. I know, I know. But <laughs> neither like, did Barty Crouch Jr. To be fair, Harry Potter has clearly not connected any of the things that no, evil it's true. Mood I did with Mood Eye the Mood Eye. <laughs> Mad Eye. <laughs> <Mad -y. laughs> <laughs> any of the evil things that Mad Eye did with Mad Eye the person. <laughs> he thinks that Mad Eye Moody is his best friend. Mad -Eye and Mad Eye Moody's like, <laughs> <Yeah>. Who are you? <laughs> We've never met. Then he goes to the Order of Phoenix headquarters while Tonks is like winking and flirting with him. Yeah, what's she doing, dude? <laughs> I don't know. And then he sees like the non romantic love of his life, Sirius Black. Oh. The only person in his life who gives him any hope. And immediately Molly Weasley steps in the way I know, and closes the door. <laughs> She's like, no. She's like, you don't Which get is, to talk to him. I think what that's a just a total day. Weasley move, you know? It is. They're so Weasley, such a Weasley little uh, family. He sees Sirius from a distance and he wants to give him a hug yeah. and Molly gets in the way, closes the door and is like, go yeah. upstairs, Harry. Because they're having know. a very important Order of the Phoenix meeting that Harry can't right. listen to. And they can't take the time to like greet yeah. or comfort this boy. For yeah, talk to second. him or tell him what he's doing there. <laughs> no one was allowed yeah. to talk to him after like, They basically died. just kidnapped him and they're like, <laughs> okay, go to your room. 
Right. Yep. And then what happens when he goes to his room? Hermione Ron is and literally Hermione waiting behind the door hug to hug him. She is like spring loaded. <laughs> She's like a rocket as soon as he opens his door. It's like a jack in the box. Just like her hug through the tent. That's her favorite well, way to hug him. She's only been hanging out with Ron up Dude, until that point. Well, I guess Ron and Ron's Hermione siblings. Doing? <laughs> just sitting silently in that room all by themselves. <laughs> and he was probably just putting the curse brain. on her and she's just like, man, I wish I could hug someone. Exactly. I think Harry <laughs> saved her from another dose of Imperius right here. <laughs> Just as I said at the end of the last movie, Harry gets just furious at them for not writing him all summer, even though he ended the last movie by being like, oh, sure. All right. Hermione. I'll write to you. I will. <laughs> I will. He was you know, 100% I will. serious. <laughs> And Dumbledore made all his friends swear not to write or yeah, talk to him dude. for three months after yeah. Cedric was murdered in front of him. Like Dumbledore is <laughs> so evil. He's so evil. <laughs> Everything Dumbledore does in this movie, he explains away at the end kind of as like, oh, trying to protect you from Voldemort. No, he was, he was just, trying to protect you know. himself. Yeah, very clearly Dumbledore is just manipulating Harry, putting him into a, like, a much worse mental state than he needs to be in, avoiding him, not giving him any mental help or support after again watching this boy die, and then, yeah, protecting himself. Like, there is no good explanation for any of this. <laughs> right. Yeah. And what does Harry do? He doubles down on Dumbledore in this oh, movie. Yeah. He's like, all right, Dumbledore's army then. <laughs> he doesn't yeah. give me attention. I'm going to get attention from him somehow. Attention. Well, maybe that was actually like he kind of was hoping Umbridge would find it out. And he was like, ah, I'm yeah, they're going to arrest Dumbledore. <laughs> <laughs> and then later he was like, oh, no, I didn't no, really no. mean it. No, because we know Harry's a <laughs> yeah, Dumbledore's no, he's man Dumbledore's through and through. through. <laughs> it's around this point, I believe, that Molly and Sirius are arguing about who is the most close to being Harry's oh, surrogate dude. parent. <laughs> this is a good conversation. And we may have to somewhat ignore the actual dialogue here and look at the subtext because what happens is that Snape interrupts. Snape gets pissed. <laughs> it's important that Snape only starts talking and gets angry when Sirius tries to lay claim to Harry. Because yes. they're like, who does Harry <laughs> and have? Molly. And Sirius says, he's got me. And then Snape bursts in and says, how touchingly paternal, Black. Maybe Potter will grow up to be a felon just like his godfather. Why would Snape care if Harry, the son of his hated rival, is taken care of by Sirius, his other hated rival bully? <laughs> this outburst makes no sense if he's not Harry's father. Yeah, he can't say anything, but he's he's laying claim right here. He's going to interrupt and just put a stop to this because he's like, I know who the real parent is. So Mr. Weasley takes Harry to the Ministry of Magic. And he takes him down in a telephone booth that he calls the visitor's entrance. And then he says, I'll just get my muggle money. But shouldn't this work on something other than muggle money? Like, would that not make it easier for muggles to accidentally get into the ministry? The money is not what makes it go down. The money is just required to activate it. Then you like have to enter a code in or something. The money is just- That is true, but Eric still makes affair. a good point. Like why even make the thing required <laughs> yeah. to activate it something that a because muggle might have and a the, wizard probably wouldn't have. The ministry needs a way to collect muggle money somehow. <laughs> this why? is their only muggle money <laughs> source. <Just> coins? <laughs> what if Maybe they, they don't to... even understand paper bills because they, they have their coin-based society. They're like, we got to get those coins from those muggles. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> They're just melting them down. I mean, it's pretty insane that they expelled him just for casting a spell in the presence of a muggle. Right. Because like well, we talked is. about in the earlier episodes, the trace is like not a good indication of who cast the spell and what it was for, <laughs> right? Like, But it is a fun like echo of what happened in the third movie where Fudge is like, it's cool, it's cool, man, forget about it. And this one he's yeah. like, you yes. are expelled. And just showing that everything is politically motivated. So... Harry has a trial. The trial's been moved. They have to rush to get there. Harry barely gets there on time. Arthur can't go in with him. And then he's there alone facing the entire wizard council. Is he alone, though? No, because Dumbledore shows up three hours early just to defend him. <laughs> and then Dumbledore won't say a word to Harry, even though Harry really nope. wants to talk to him. <laughs> nope, he won't even look at him. At this point, well, he's like, oh, I'm distancing myself because I thought maybe Voldemort would try to target me through you. But this is before we even fully established that Harry has that connection with Voldemort. I mean, we did have the one dream he had in the last movie that Dumbledore just completely ignored. Yeah, <laughs> but like completely. they haven't confirmed it. And so he's just like, mm, maybe there's a connection. I am going to completely avoid this boy. As Dumbledore defends Harry... Dumbledore is absolutely trying to imply that the Ministry sent these Dementors 
to murder Harry. Like, he is totally, legitimately trying to oust Cornelius. It's exactly as he fears. No, you're right. Yeah, either way, he's implying that Fudge is not equipped to handle this situation. Dumbledore manages to win the trial with that. Uh, it's still a close vote, but he gets Harry off. And so Harry's able to go to school again. Right. He goes to King's Cross Station. Sirius Black shows up. Why does he risk getting caught just to talk to Harry at King's Cross? It's to give him an old photo of the original Order of the Phoenix, people whom Harry has no connection to. And he did this just to tell Harry that one member of the Order was horribly murdered by Voldemort a couple weeks later, and that two other members were horribly tortured until they went insane. That's the only thing he does in this scene. He loves He's scaring like, Harry. He, he just shows up to scare Harry. <laughs> They had the train in the studio tour. It's a real train that they repurposed for the movie. It's so cool. They had like six different cars that you could walk through and they redecorated each car to be from a different Harry Potter movie. One of the most interesting parts of the tour was the fact that every single car, despite having a plaque telling you which movie it was from, was completely indistinguishable from every other car. <laughs> <laughs> they were all the same. Wow. Because the cars don't change depending on the movie. <laughs> what are they doing? Oh. <laughs> this is the part oh. of the tour. I mean, they they <laughs> like, told you. Here's another car. There's like some candy wrappers on the seat. Okay, next car. <laughs> some candy wrappers <laughs> on the seat. All right. <laughs> oh, oh, man, I loved it. It was great. When they arrive at Hogwarts, why would they have evil death horses pull all the students into Hogwarts? Like, is this yeah, just no. to trick and embarrass the already traumatized students who have witnessed exactly. death? <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> seems that to be what it is. Just the this? meanest prank they can think of for traumatized Hogwarts students. <laughs> if you were traumatized before you started going to Hogwarts, it's pretty bad. It's even worse if you're traumatized while going right? to Hogwarts like Harry. <laughs> because right. these horses are scary, like skeleton horses. Yeah. And when you see them and point them out, everyone else will call you insane because they can't see them. <laughs> the craziest thing about it to me, too, is that, like, we know Hermione is a huge, like, history nerd, that she's read Hogwarts of History several times. The Thestrals were apparently never mentioned in there, so they nope. maybe are a relatively new thing. Because everyone who's seen them thinks they're crazy, so yeah. no one wants to mention it. <laughs> it's a big prank. <laughs> well, no, but here's the other thing, is that Hagrid cares for them. He's the groundkeeper. He knows they're there. He never mentioned them. He never taught them about them in care of magical creatures. <laughs> like, these things are being intentionally hidden we're going to learn one thing in this movie and that is that hagrid is exceptionally good at keeping secrets when he wants to mm -hmm. this is one of the major secrets that hagrid has always kept for his what 30 years as the groundskeeper at hogwarts and has never let it slip even once when it's not like they can't make horseless carriages. No, they, they could, could even just make horsed, horse carriages. The only <laughs> advantage of using a Thestral is the fact that they can fly. And these carts don't fly. They're just yeah. cold. <laughs> and we also know that they have a winged horse that can fly that's not scary and only visible by students who and have witnessed they have, death. They have hippogriffs. They don't need like, winged horses. Yeah, but uh, this is the introduction of, of Luna Lovegood, who tells Harry when he's scared of these invisible horses. Luna assures him, you're not crazy, or at least no more than I am, as she's reading the Quibbler upside down. And I love that introduction for Luna, and I love Luna as a character, and I really love Ivana Lynch as Luna. I think she does such a perfect job. So the actual story is that when she was very young, she had a really severe uh, eating disorder, and she wrote fan mail to J.K. Rowling about it. And J.K. Rowling wrote her back and encouraged her, and she eventually overcame her eating disorder. And then she went and ended up auditioning and getting the part. And so it was this really like beautiful thing for her and J.K. Rowling that like they had this kind of pre-existing friendship, and then she ended up being in the movie. Also, the radish earrings she wears were actually the actress's creation. She made them herself. As they arrive in the main hall and Dumbledore gives his speech, I just want to say Imelda Staunton, who played Dolores Umbridge, is a really good actor and perfectly yeah. cast for this role. Yeah, <laughs> I can't no, think of anyone amazing. else to play Professor Umbridge. When you have a villain that is just so universally hated like that, you know that they were played very, very well. <laughs> Dumbledore kind of feels like he always has like something in his back pocket in the books. Like he's he's a, he's one up on Umbridge this whole time. I love Gambon's reactions to Umbridge. <laughs> just like what? Like the complete opposite of book now. Dumbledore. Okay. Like, what's going on? Oh, I, I guess you could do give a little speech. I don't know. <laughs> Where where's my chair? Where do I go? <laughs> 
<laughs> I've never had to sit down before. One tiny detail from the Great Feast. Snape is the only one who starts to applaud for Professor Grubbly Plank returning to Hogwarts. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> no one else cares about Grubbly Plank. I thought Plank. That I this was just supposed to show how socially inept he is, like that he just <laughs> yeah, didn't read the that's room how and I thought you were supposed to applaud. So I got curious about Grubbly Plank because I was like, I know she's not the previous Care of Magical Creatures instructor because that was Kettleburn. And it turns out that she was from the fourth book, but not in the fourth movie, where Hagrid was removed from his position temporarily after Rita Skeeta wrote an article exposing him as a half giant. And so she had come and was in the school for a while and then they reinstated Hagrid, but then Hagrid left again. So they brought her back anyway. And I guess, yeah, Snape's the only person who cared. No, in that case, Snape clapping is a deliberate dig on Hagrid. Like he's saying... Yeah, you're out, Hagrid. She's back. You know, your replacement is here. I mean, you may be right. I don't know that there's a lot of evidence for Snape specifically disliking Hagrid. <laughs> so yeah, great opening feast. And then after that, we go to the next scene where Harry is having a nightmare. We learn that Ron watches Harry sleep. Yes, <laughs> yeah. he's watching Harry sleep. Like he just completely unabashedly, unblinkingly just seems to be staring at Harry. Harry wakes up and doesn't question that or find no, out No, he's like, good, all. you're here. <laughs> You're watching. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, and it doesn't look like Ron was just like, oh, you're waking up and like stop to see if he's OK. Like he was sitting there staring at Harry. <laughs> <laughs> I think that possibly Harry would have less nightmares if he didn't sleep in such an unbelievably freaking tiny bed. <laughs> well, he doesn't have any control over that. They're the same no, beds he they've had since Dumbledore was there. Exactly. So the uh, I, in the studio tour, I got to see the Gryffindor common room, and those beds are so tiny. They are so small. And that's because <laughs> they were made for 10-year-olds, and they were never updated. <laughs> they kept the exact same beds from when they were 10 till when they were 18, 19 years old at the end of the what series. What great Hogwarts planning. <laughs> it's so good. They filled their common room with 10-year-old beds. And they just didn't get any more. <laughs> They're like, well, that's your bed. So. Okay, it works. The wizard in charge of planning that was like, uh, they're kids, right? Yeah, we don't need much room. And someone was like, wait, don't kids grow up? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. We can shrink them. <laughs> Why not grow yeah. the beds? <laughs> we don't have space no, for no room. beds. Are you can't crazy? grow the beds. <laughs> In the later movies, you can see whenever they have a scene like this and the person's laying in the bed, they have to be all like curled up and like scrunched in there because <laughs> you really can't fit in those beds. They're tiny. Like they barely would fit a 10 year old. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> At one point, Ron asks Hermione to write his paper. Yes. And she makes a big show of saying no, as he probably told her to do, you know, to eliminate suspicion. But what does she do in the end? She agrees to write his paper, or at least the introduction. Mm -hmm. Not only that, did she agree to do that, which seems out of character for her, assuming we're ignoring the books where she did that a lot. But after that, she like immediately, as soon as she's done with that conversation with Ron, goes and sits next to Harry and is so yeah. concerned about him. And it's like, Harry, like, are you doing OK? And, and worried about him. So I felt like that was also a pretty good show of like her being under Imperius versus her not. <laughs> For the very first Defense Against the Dark Arts course, Professor Umbridge takes command and basically says she's going to teach them little kid spells and not have them practice, which seems like a great way to create a generation of useless wizards. I do see how that's how it feels. But if you think about it, this is a public education system. They're essentially training students for war in this class, right? And like, that's not something you'd normally do in like K through 12 regular education. Like there's no reason that most students would need a lot of these like curses and, and jinxes and things that they're teaching unless they're planning to fight, but they shouldn't be planning to fight. So it seems like Defense Against the Dark Arts, like... A couple of basic things like Protego and stuff, sure. But like beyond that, why do you need to teach it to all the students? Yeah. And they don't spend a lot of time on Protego. No, because no, no I one wish ever they did. uses <laughs> They <it>. need it. <laughs> no, I, I get that point of view, Brita. But also it's kind of like if that's the case, then Defense Against the Dark Arts, the course, shouldn't even exist. Yeah, I actually agree. It should be kind of like the ROTC program where like, I guess you can enroll if you want and become like, you know, you're planning to go into the military, but that should right. really be the only reason why you would take this class. Some schools actually offer like Taekwondo courses or Judo courses. 
in those courses, it would be like if one year you signed up and the professor's like, yeah, there's been some changes this year. We're just going to learn doing about the history fighting. of Taekwondo. <laughs> so open up your books and you'd be like, what? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and then you're yeah, like, why can't we learn to actually fight? And they're like, what? Do you think we're raising an army? <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> you know, like. That's the only reason I, you'd ever need to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will say uh, that although I, I still do think that Defense Against the Dark Arts shouldn't be taught to all the students, at least not in the way that it currently is. Uh, uh, maybe is like a self-defense course. Uh, but she says, like, you'll never need your wand in this class. And that seems crazy. Like I said, they should at least be teaching them Protego. And you should practice Protego. Professor Umbridge is the fifth Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher who is basically actively trying to, like, kill Harry. <laughs> so Dumbledore sure yeah. knows how to pick him. Most of the year, Lupin wasn't actively. Yes, he was. No. Lupin definitely actively tried to kill Harry. <laughs> Most of the year, he was more so actively than many of the him. others. Like in a much more visceral, <laughs> physical way. Only on a way. couple of nights a year was he actively <laughs> trying to kill no, Harry. No, Lupin did it. Um, and you might say Gilderoy didn't. Yes, he did. Gilderoy was going to wipe Harry's memory or kill him. That was his yeah. plan. And leave him in the chamber of secrets yeah. at the very yeah. end. <laughs> they all actively tried tried to kill Harry at some point. In fact, Dolores Umbridge is the only one who doesn't. <laughs> so, it's true. She's um, antagonistic, but she isn't necessarily no, she does not want to kill <laughs> Harry. No. Um, <laughs> she does want to yeah. crucio him at one point, but that's another story. Yeah, a little torture. <laughs> I really, really love the scene with the detention, though, with the I must not tell lies. Tell lies. Yeah. I think yep. that's just such a good punishment. It's so sinister. What's so great about it in the books and the movies is that it doesn't truly pay off until the sixth mm -hmm. one when Scrimgeour tells him to tell lies. And he's like, I'm sorry, I, I must, must not, not tell, tell lies. lies. <laughs> in the movies, it pays off again when he's he's actually going up against Umbridge and he's like uh, Polyjuice Potioned. Oh, and yeah. he's like, that's a lie, Umbridge, and you must not tell lies. Wow. So it pays off three times. Once in this movie, once when he's polyjuiced, and once in the books. Well, and I thought it was always cool that like he's got the scar on his forehead. He gets another scar that's even more meaningful. Yeah, so many <laughs> scars. Just... <laughs> Why does Harry just go along with it? He is so freaking angry and rebellious in every other aspect of his life. But here he's like, I'm going to give her all the power. It's because he's so angry. If he shows that it's getting to him, then if he reacts in any way, he's giving her power. Well, but he's giving her power by torturing himself. No, but the like, point is to torture him. But if he acts like it doesn't bother him, he just does it. Then, you know, that's like the anime way of doing this. She wants you to scream and cry and be like, I can't do this, Umbridge. And you just double down. You say, all right, all right. You know, 20 lines. Okay, then don't <laughs> scream and cry. <laughs> just like sit there swearing at her and telling her what a disgrace and a failure of a teacher she is. Because she wants that reaction. I always thought that it was pretty badass that Harry does it completely silently and doesn't complain. I agree with Eric. I think it makes sense as an act of defiance. Despite Hermione being like, you've got to tell Dumbledore. He's like, I can't tell Dumbledore. So he doesn't want to tell Dumbledore, but he does talk to Sirius again. And they changed it so that Sirius's face is actually in the fire this movie. The fireplace <laughs> trick suddenly became a much cheaper effect. <laughs> I know. <Yeah. laughs> it's, it's more true to the book, though. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Sirius says, the latest intelligence is that Fudge doesn't want you trained in combat. And Ron says, what does he think? We're forming some sort of army? And Sirius says, that's exactly what he thinks. That Dumbledore is assembling his own forces to take on the Ministry. And he is. I he mean, is. <laughs> they start Dumbledore's army directly after this, like in the next scene. Yeah, I always so. found that very weird. Unless Harry is doing it as a screw you to Dumbledore. It's like, I know. you, you it's know like this is exactly what you need to, like, they're trying to draw attention away from. And you're going to name it Dumbledore's <laughs> army? <laughs> yep. In the coming scene where Umbridge becomes the High Inquisitor, I just love her absolute lack of chemistry with Trelawney and Snape and everyone, <laughs> yeah. uh, Warwick Davis. Like, I love how she goes and measures him <laughs> as so if that rude. has any bearing on how good of a teacher he is. Well, it's because she's like racist against all non humans and half she's half goblin. So horrible. But yeah, it's like she <laughs> digs into Snape for not getting the defense against the dark arts position. It's so good. I love it. <laughs> I love it. It's so good. They all hate her it's so much. <laughs> She's really trying to get killed by a lot of powerful people. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> 
Why is Flitwick allowed to use magic? Because goblins aren't. He's a half goblin. Well, he used to be much more half goblins. He's <laughs> undergone a lot of He had some surgery. <laughs> okay, he wanted to appear more human, but not taller. <laughs> not taller. Well, that'd be really human. tough surgery, I assume. It was mostly just hair gel. <laughs> <laughs> and dye. Everyone's signing up for Dumbledore's army, and this is exactly what Fudge is afraid of. I love the DA training montage, though. I think it's really, really well done. It, it's a great way of showing them all, like, learning. But it also, like, kind of shows, like they're kids and they're having fun and like they're at Hogwarts and breaking the rules and it's this really cool thing and then it gets back to being serious after. My favorite part of that montage was them standing in a circle around a moving dummy <laughs> blasting dangerous Just spells directly at each at other, each other. <laughs> until yeah. it explodes. It's the most <laughs> dangerous thing ever. Harry is teaching them the only techniques he knows. And he learned this from the Ministry of Magic in Goblet of Fire. This is the <laughs> technique they used on him when they surrounded him and started blasting each other. Yeah, but he knew it was spells. a bad idea. He can no, he didn't. Like He's to... like, this is how professionals do it. <laughs> we need to do it like this. <laughs> yeah. There's one very important piece of evidence uh, that Ron cast the Imperious Curse on Hermione. So they're going to have a practice duel, and Ron specifically says loudly to everyone around him, he's like, I'm going to go easy on you, Hermione, you know, downplaying her abilities. And then after she easily beats him with one spell, he again downplays her accomplishment, being like, yeah, yeah, I did that on purpose, guys. He's telling the truth when he says, I let her do that. It's good manners, <laughs> isn't it? It was intentional. <laughs> She is under the Imperious Curse, and he's literally saying, I let her do that. So you think he's bragging to everyone. He's like, look at my accomplishment. I <laughs> yeah. forced her to do this. I won this <laughs> match because I had her defeat me. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> I couldn't have lost either way. <laughs> the instant that Harry and Cho Chang are alone... Why didn't the room of requirement like turn into a big heart shaped bed with like a disco ball in the ceiling? <laughs> um, I, I do believe that is what the room of requirement would be used for most, right? Yes, yeah. it probably is. <laughs> and it did make mistletoe. I mean, yeah, I don't think they were quite at the point for a big heart. Right, they didn't bed require yet. that yet. <laughs> no, okay, yeah. sorry. They just wanted to kiss. When Harry is staring at Cho, Ron gives Hermione a look. He says nothing, but then she says. See you in the common room, Harry. And they both oh, leave. Oh, oh. <laughs> wow. I her, think like he just, master. you know, he was using the Imperious Curse. He, he uh -huh. forced her to leave just then. Because, you know, he's, he's a good bro. He wants Harry to have alone time with Cho. And also, he doesn't want Harry to be around Hermione. As bad as Harry and Cho are in this, meaning their lack of chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. I do think Cho is better in the movie as a just quiet, shy person than in the book where she was just an insane person who was just like <laughs> mad with grief. <laughs> and this, she's just really like, like she's sad and quiet yeah. and just like a normal person, you know? It's the worst kiss scene I've ever seen. <laughs> like, they're not touching each other. They're standing like at least five inches, yeah, no, six inches it is apart. So bad. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's so insanely bad. It doesn't look fun at all. And then yeah. afterwards Harry's bragging to his friends about it. And I'm like, why? Yeah. Hermione asks how it was, and he says, What? Well, she was crying. <laughs> and uh, Ron says, that bad at it, are we? And Hermione says, I'm sure Harry's kissing was more than satisfactory. So Hermione starts sticking up for Harry's kissing abilities which maybe she's been fantasizing about, and then <laughs> turns to Ron and says he has the emotional range of a teaspoon, a teaspoon. because he's a freaking psychopath, <laughs> um, and she knows it. <laughs> I think around this time is when Snape comes to help Harry with his dream problems. I'm going to penetrate your, <laughs> your mind. <laughs> mind. <laughs> if this was an actual penetration test, usually what the company would do is you would set forth the rules of engagement first thing, where you say, these are the systems that we will breach and this is the data that we will access. And a lot of the time, the company will set up dummy data there for you to access mm -hmm. because they don't want you accessing like the actual secret data. 
So I think maybe Harry and Snape should have set up some rules of engagement for this uh, penetration test first. I <laughs> don't like, think okay, that Harry. Snape can control what he sees when he p- casts Legilimens. Like, I think it's kind of controlled by Harry. Exactly. So he should have been like, OK, Harry, here's how this works. When I do this, you're going to feel this. And I want you to focus on this so that we well, will, yeah. you know, stay <laughs> yeah, focused like, on these memories. And that's what I'm going to test. If well, I can yeah, get I at this m- memory, the most important then thing I win. About this is- the situation is that Snape's method of he teaching is him not is just teaching to yell, concentrate. Snape Harry. is a horrible <laughs> teacher. He, yeah. he doesn't give him any like technique, any actionable directions Nothing. whatsoever. Yeah, he just starts invading his focus mind. and starts blasting him with legitimacy spells. <laughs> I think maybe it's because we're getting this from Harry's perspective and he's just not paying attention. And from his perspective, it's just like, oh, it's like, just blasting with spells. I don't know. Just concentrate. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Concentrate. Oh, hey, what's going on over there? Oh, he's saying concentrate. (laughs) It's like, oh, Uh, kissing Joe sure was fun. I'm going to think about that. Oh, no. Sleep (laughs) saw it. Oh, Oh, man. (laughs) (laughs) Like his mind is clearly wandering. If Harry had just been a better pupil to Snape, Sirius would have survived. So you think Snape was the world's greatest teacher, and we just didn't of get course. to see it. Of <laughs> course. I mean, there's some okay. evidence for that. Not in this movie, in the next one. The next movie proves that if Harry had just paid attention to Snape, he would have been amazing at potions. Potions, and, yeah. 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 <laughs> so why is Hermione at the Weasley's house for Christmas? This isn't even the Weasley's house. It's the Black's house. Why are they all at the Black's house for Christmas? So there is another mini theory that Hermione actually wiped her parents' memory of her at the end of fourth year and that she's been basically homeless ever since. And that's why she's always at the Weasleys. And she just does it again in the seventh movie? What Brita's saying is that moment in the seventh movie happened at the end of fourth year. So you're saying that Harry should know this, but is just so like absolutely inattentive that he never Which uh, is exactly the problem it. that Snape was just having in class. Yes, yeah, seems okay. accurate. <laughs> okay. He's yeah, inattentive. I, I, I 100% that's what happened. I guess just so Hermione <laughs> made herself homeless for no reason. Well, no, because <laughs> she knew that Voldemort was back and that she's very close to Harry. And so she immediately thought she might be a target. That's why she said everything's going to change now, isn't it? Oh and made them gosh. promise to just write her. Write every day. <laughs> she had just told them her horrible plan to upend her life. Jerks. And all he caught was the end of that sentence. <laughs> She's like, yeah, I got to do some crazy stuff. I got to protect my parents. Like, I'm, I think I'm going to have to just erase myself from their memory. Oh, man, everything's going to change now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And then Harry's like, yeah. Sure Will you so please good. write yeah. me? Because I have no one else in my life right <laughs> sure, now. And Ron's sure. like... You know I won't write. <laughs> and then Harry completely sincerely said, sure, every day. <laughs> yep. Okay, this Christmas scene is very important for the Ron cast the Imperious Curse on Hermione theory. So Hermione's just sitting there, fawning over Ron, just like staring at him and wistfully smiling. Like, <laughs> he's not even doing anything. He's just <laughs> opening a present. <laughs> and then he doesn't even put it on. He just, like, puts it to the side and is like, go yeah. away, mom. She tries right? to get him like, to put it on. <laughs> but right here, she doesn't. Right here, she's just like, oh, I love the way you tell your mom to leave. <laughs> like, she's <laughs> just so into him. And she never, ever does this. Like, this is just completely out of character for her. Anytime we see Ron and Hermione, even in this movie, they're usually like exchanging, you know, witty banter and berating each other. Uh, Like she's usually saying something witty about him and he's saying something stupid about her. (laughs) But um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and this is the only time I've ever noticed. The only time I have ever seen Harry arrive at a place and not be immediately just like bowled over by an overjoyed Hermione throwing right. herself at him. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> like she always <laughs> makes a point to greet Harry in the you know the biggest grandest the most, possible way whenever yeah, the biggest he arrives. PDA possible. <laughs> he shows up and she doesn't even look at him. She won't make eye contact with Harry for the entirety of this scene. And this is where he says, look at me. Right? <laughs> yes. No, it's not. <laughs> no. Not at all. <laughs> Harry doesn't notice. <laughs> but I think Ron noticed that she was paying so much attention to Harry. And I think he changed his imperious tactic to tell Hermione not to be so loving to Harry and instead dote on him a little more. <laughs> well, and this is the year after they, you know, had that photograph taken of them where they're hugging over and over again. <laughs> So is this where he says, and in Dumbledore's office, there was a moment when I wanted to. 
I feel like I'm angry all the time. Exactly. Yes. Harry starts talking to Sirius. They're having a bit of a heart to heart. I just really like that line. I feel like I'm angry all the time. I yeah. don't remember if that was in the book, but that's how I felt when I was reading the book. I was just like, why is Harry angry all the time? And yeah. uh, I like how they kind of called it out in the movie. Yeah. yeah, no, I I had the exact same reaction. This scene gives so much context for him being angry all the time, right? Whereas in the book, I felt like I didn't have that. It was the first book that came out after the movies had started coming out. So it felt like J.K. Rowling had just realized, wait, my Harry has right. no personality like and I need to give him yeah. one. And so his personality was just angry. But like Daniel Radcliffe plays it really well where like, you know, his anger has a reason and he also isn't even as like over the top. No, angry. he's no, not he's nearly not. as angry he's, as Book he's Harry, like, he's less which is than good. It makes it easier to like him. <laughs> They come back after Christmas and Hagrid is back. And so they run to his cottage and they see him kind of fighting with Umbridge, telling her, I've been away from me health. And he's all cut up and she doesn't like it and tells him not to unpack. And so then they go talk to him and he explains that he was sent away to parley with the giants by Dumbledore. And he tells them that he's not sure if it worked or not, but he did his best. He gave him the message. He knows that it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, in the book he explains much more seriously. He was run like, out of there by the Death Eaters who basically took over. <laughs> so Yes, that he had won over one giant leader, but that giant leader got killed got and murdered. a new person <laughs> took over, got murdered, yep. And the Death Eaters totally took control. Right. Well, now, but the only witness for any of this, though, is Hagrid, right? Right. Yeah. So the whole story he concocts could have been a lie. There may not have even been Death Eaters there at all. It may have just been Hagrid there winning them over for the Death Eaters, <laughs> trying to tell the giants to go side with Voldemort. So he's hurt and he says, the giants did this to you? And Hagrid says, not exactly, no. No, it was his brother. It was crop. But listen, Cornelius Fudge strongly suspects the Azkaban breakout was masterminded by someone familiar with breaking out of Azkaban. Whoa. Hagrid was Dude, literally just, just at Azkaban. Azkaban. <laughs> and no. he may have stopped by the giants briefly to go pick up his weird brother. But I think he broke the people out of Azkaban and that's how he got hurt. I think that's highly possible. But what do we know about Hagrid in these movies? Is he like a bumbling oaf who randomly spills secrets for no reason at random? Or is he some kind of savvy, underhanded spy capable of complex, covert military <laughs> operations? I think it's interesting that this, you know, bumbling loser who can't keep a secret was a member of the Order of the Phoenix since the first Wizarding War and continued to be an active member. And Dumbledore decides to send him all alone to not only find the giants, but also turn this entire race to his cause. An mm -hmm. incredibly secret mission that if if the ministry found out about it would be like ridiculously huge news. It indicates that Hagrid is extremely competent, very strategically capable. He knows how to negotiate and how to lie, how to tip the scales in his favor, most importantly, how to keep secrets. We also know that Hagrid survived. And like you said, Brita, mm -hmm. he successfully engaged the giants until Death Eaters showed up at which point he single-handedly escaped unharmed with his half-brother, who's a toddler. Then he made it all the way back to Hogwarts without once alerting the Ministry or even raising any suspicion. If he is a seasoned military spy who can handle sensitive information with such tact and discretion, how come he blabs and reveals so many confidential things throughout this entire series? <laughs> it's because every time Hagrid slips up, every single time he reveals some secret information, it undeniably helps Voldemort to reach his goals every <laughs> single time. He is only klutzy and stupid whenever it helps Voldemort. I also want to look into uh, the book's description of Hagrid's negotiation with the giants. Like you said, Brita, it's a little different in the books, uh, how he tells it. He actually went there with Madame Maxine. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, he was bearing a number of valuable, irreplaceable gifts to sway the giants to join Dumbledore including like a magical, indestructible goblin helmet. And then suddenly, oh, no, there's a big coup and the Death Eaters showed up and oh, Hagrid got to get out of there. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> According to Hagrid, nobody knows where the giants live uh, in, in the books. Yeah. In the movies, he says they're not exactly yeah. hard to find. <laughs> yeah. In the, the, in the books, movies, he's like, yeah, they're everywhere. <laughs> no, in the books, he's like, no one knows where they live. Uh, even I, a half giant from this exact tribe, do not know where the tribe is. I have to be told by Dumbledore where they are. <laughs> he received this sensitive information. And what do you know? The instant he learned where the giants lived 
and gave them a bunch of valuable irreplaceable artifacts. The Death Eaters showed up out of nowhere and got all those valuable oh, no. irreplaceable artifacts. <laughs> How could this have happened? Huh. Oh, what a coincidence, mm. right? <laughs> How could the Death Eaters have known where the giants, Hagrid's own tribe, lived if even he didn't know? <laughs> like, Voldemort's been freaking dead for over a decade. He wouldn't know. <laughs> like, there's only one explanation, and that is as soon as Hagrid learned of their location, he <laughs> let the Death Eaters know. Yeah. He, hmm. As soon as he got this info and all these gifts, he said, hey guys, be here at this exact place on this exact date for a pile of valuable artifacts and the support of the giants who I've already convinced to join you. <laughs> like that's the only way to interpret what happened yeah. because there's no reason that the Death Eaters would show up the instant Hagrid showed up. And this entire expedition was a massive loss for Dumbledore mm -hmm. and a massive gain for Voldemort. Yeah, that's true. Let's let's unpack the scene where Hagrid shows them his brother in the forest. So he is keeping his brother as a feral child in the forest. He's letting his brother hunt for his own food. Either his brother has mental issues or he is a toddler who's not old enough to speak. Regardless, I don't believe he should be catching his own food. No. And I don't necessarily know how giant parenting works, but I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to keep them chained to a tree He's in the forest up. He forever. He can't even hunt for food. He would be starving. <laughs> Yeah, I thought that too when he said that. <laughs> then he leaves him in the care of three regular 15-year-olds. Yep. Yep, see ya. Dumbledore's army is discovered because Cho is such a little rat snitch. Umbridge was giving them Verita serum, yeah. wasn't she? <laughs> yes, sure. she was. They reveal she that later. She had no choice. And Harry never says sorry to her. I feel so bad for this Cho. Like, I, I don't necessarily feel bad for Book Cho because she was a little weird. But this Cho, like, she's just a nice person. Yeah, no, she's yeah. just And she was given Verita Serum. She wasn't going to give him away. Yeah, and Book Cho, one, didn't give him away. And two, her friend who did also didn't do it because of Verita Serum. So important evidence that Dumbledore is evil and creating an army. He's like, the parchment clearly says Dumbledore's army, not Potter's. Mm -hmm. I instructed Harry to form this organization, and I alone am responsible for its activities. At which point Fudge says to escort Dumbledore to Azkaban. And then he doesn't do the legal thing and go with them. Yes. He says, I thought we might hit this little snag. You seem to be laboring under the delusion that I'm going to, what was the phrase, come quietly? Well, I can tell you this. I have no intention of going to Azkaban. That's how he sounded. And then he murders his phoenix and explodes instead of apparating. And then Shacklebolt is like, man, Dumbledore's got style. He's got style, dude. <laughs> also, Shacklebolt is a member of the Order of the Phoenix. Like, yes. There was no way Dumbledore was getting arrested right there. <laughs> yeah. Snape is doing lessons with Harry. And they are in the memory where he's a little kid looking in the mirror of Erised. But I love the way they use young Harry glancing up in the mirror, you know, a shot they shot years ago. And mm -hmm. he's looking right at Snape. Mm -hmm. He's like, what was that Snape? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and Snape says to Harry, you're just like your father, lazy, arrogant, weak. Like, he's obviously being very self-deprecating here. He's hard on and... himself, dude. He's like, I wish I could help you. I'm too lazy. I thought I could help you. I'm so arrogant, but I'm too weak. <laughs> and we'll see that he's changed, but he certainly could have been described as all of those things. Yeah. And then he tells Harry to control his emotions and discipline his mind, which is things that Snape must have done because he's clearly not lazy, arrogant, and weak anymore. Mm -hmm. So, And he says, life isn't fair. Your blessed father knew that. In fact, he frequently saw to it. Like, he could still be describing himself because he says, blessed. Yeah. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, and he frequently saw unfair. to it that things weren't fair. Like, he gave Harry all the attention in his first potions class. <laughs> mm -hmm. Life isn't fair. It's stacked in your favor, Potter. <laughs> but what about, my father was a great man. Your father was a swine. <laughs> well, you know, he's mad at himself. It, 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 it's his, kind of his fault that Lily died. Well, no, so it's not at all You his don't fault think that Lily died. there's any chance that he's <laughs> talking about the bullies who hung him upside down and took his yeah, pants off? Yeah, he's talking about James. He's like, the guy you think is your father is lazy and arrogant and weak and a swine. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want to go with the lazy, arrogant interpretation, then sure. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, Harry casts Protego and we get a flashback of Harry's father bullying Snape. Is there any redeeming James? Like he's he's literally just Dudley. 
He's doing a Dudley right here. He's like well, Snape he... is Harry and James is Dudley. It's 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 a a, a mirror of the first scene of the movie, right? Yeah. Which <laughs> like, I, I mean, no, I know we've talked about this before, but like if they did a prequel series, it'd be so amazing because Snape would be the main character. <laughs> but most importantly, if they're trying to mirror the first scene of the movie, why would they have the person playing Harry be Snape and not James? Maybe because Snape is Harry's father. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what they're trying to show here. I also liked Sirius's nice one, James, just for wow. using Expelliarmus. Like, it's mm -hmm. not hard. <laughs> so after that, Snape is very upset, understandably so, and kicks Harry out. What's your explanation for that if he is Harry's father and he's now leaving him without any protection from Voldemort invading his mind? Harry just aced the exam. He invaded Snape's mind. Harry's yeah, good enough now. Yeah, but we now. know that his he mind is still not protected. <laughs> That's different. That shows Harry can do legilimency, and occlumency is something different. Occlumency uh, is protecting your mind from attacks. Also, Harry can't do attacks. legilimency. Harry no, he only uses Protego. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, it doesn't really make sense. But Snape can use legilimency, and Harry used it on him. But yeah, so we know for a fact that Harry still can't protect his mind, because he doesn't, and that's what causes the end of this movie. So why did Snape <laughs> leave him vulnerable? Well, no, it's because he knows that Harry can see his past now. And if Harry looks too far into his past, oh, he's going to realize him that yes. Snape is his mom. father. <laughs> oh, that was ew. the only explanation I could come up with as well. <laughs> he's going to see the night they had that an he affair. Was, he realized, he was like, if this happens again, he might see some things that I don't want him to see between me right, and Right, like how I was watching him making out with Cho. <laughs> He'll see him <laughs> yeah. making out with his mom. <laughs> wow. That's great. Next scene I have anything to say about is the owls. This scene is basically just like Fred and George are absolute legends and they're the coolest. Yeah. They're like, screw this. We're out of here. We're going to throw the world's biggest party and knock down all of her plaques and chase her out of the room and leave forever. Yeah. And apparently there are no legal repercussions for any of that. Nope. Luckily for them, Umbridge is incapable of taking out her wand and doing anything yeah. about it. <laughs> so I was going to say this. I feel like this happens many times in the movies, but this is the most noticeable scene where like she could have done anything. Like she never draws her wand or does anything except scream and run. And I was thinking it really seems like a lot of wizards can't do magic on the fly because like she could just use finita incantatum and get rid of this giant snake wow. monster Only her that could hurt that. students as well <laughs> no 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 dragon is what a snake monster is usually called <laughs> yeah snake monster <laughs> So then they decide we got to go and get Sirius out of the Department of Mysteries. Harry tries to do it alone and his friends insist on going with him and they get caught by Umbridge and then, yeah, this leads into the best scene in the whole movie yeah, where the Harry most says to Snape, line. <laughs> he's got Padfoot. He's got Padfoot at the place where it's hidden. And Umbert says, what are you talking about? And Snape turns around and says, no, no idea. idea. <laughs> <laughs> so good. I could watch that scene for like 20 minutes. Just Literally on... <laughs> almost right. an hour well, see, <laughs> on repeat. Yes, yeah, so you should always put that, that scene on repeat. But... <laughs> What's great about this cool moment is that Harry and Snape, even though they don't necessarily like each other, they are so close. They can speak in code that Umbridge can't even understand. They never practice this code. The father and the son, they just uh, are on the same wavelength, you know? Yeah. Sure. And Hermione is the one to break and she says, we'll, we'll show you Dumbledore's secret weapon. I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I feel like Grop does not need to be in this movie. No, I agree. He doesn't. I, and he's be a so better terrible. Movie and a better yeah, the CG for so it's really bad. Mm -hmm. He looks just like he looks worse than the troll in the first movie. Yeah, he looks awful. <laughs> she ends up getting punished by the centaurs anyway. So yeah, he has no purpose. I mean, this is the setup for one amazing callback, at least, where Umbridge shouts, Potter, do something. Tell them I mean no harm. And he says, I'm sorry, Professor. I must not tell lies. Yeah. Which yeah. is, you know, <laughs> the first good callback with more to come. So they leave her to her grim fate. <laughs> they meet up with the rest of Dumbledore's army and they head off to the ministry on... Thestrals. Yeah, they fly to London on invisible horses. <laughs> they don't show how terrifying this would be for the people who can't see them. Yeah, that would be pretty horrible. <laughs> My most important question is, how did they get into the Department of Mysteries? Yeah, I also like, think that they, who knows? there's yeah, no way they're there. <laughs> you can just get no, in. Because all you and need he, is I mean, muggle, money, some muggle money, money. Harry yeah. has. You just had to pay <laughs> your way in. A pretty famous mini theory here that uh, Neville 
is actually the chosen one and that Harry is not. The canon is that it could have been Neville or it could have been Harry. But Voldemort and that by, chose Harry. And yeah, Voldemort Harry. attacked Harry and chose him basically as his chosen one. It would be pretty hard to disprove that in the book. In the movie, it's a little more up in the air. They're not they don't really, you know, get into the nitty gritty of it and like you know, clearly define what's going on. One of the main things that points to Neville having been the chosen one all along is that they go looking for the prophecy about the chosen one. And Harry specifically does not find this prophecy. He walks right past it and can't find it anywhere. Who finds it? Well, it's Neville who finds it. He is the one who says, hey, hey, I think it's over here. And the prophecy starts glowing when he gets near it and begins to prophesy. And Lucius, just a few seconds later, specifically tells them, prophecies can only be retrieved by those about whom they are made. Neville retrieved this theory. Harry did not because Neville was the only one who was able to find it. But he says, Harry, it's got your name on it. Right, but Harry's the one who picks it up. But I also have to say, definitely it is not true that you can only pick up a prophecy if it's about you, because they just go on prophecy rampage, just destroying so Well, you can so shatter prophecies. prophecies if they're not about <laughs> yeah. you. I mean, you they knock them down, them they kick them around. <laughs> just real quick about the prophecy. I think Trelawney meant to say, neither can die while the other survives. Instead that would make neither way more sense. live yeah. while the other survives. So this starts a pretty cool fight scene between Dumbledore's army and the Death Eaters in which Dumbledore's army seems to just be dominating. <laughs> it, it doesn't make any sense that everyone is turning into mist and flying around. The Death Eaters That's are doing just it. What the Order they of the do. Phoenix is doing it. Yeah. When adults fight, they turn into they mist turn and into they mist. fly around. Supposedly, this is apparating, even though we know from this movie that when the twins apparate, it's just an instantaneous thing. Yep. <laughs> it doesn't look like mist. And also, you shouldn't be able to, like, fight while you apparate. <laughs> That's silly. There are two kinds of apparating. One you do in combat, the other you do not in combat. <laughs> the one not in combat is instantaneous. The combat one is better. really cool and weird and flying around. Wow. They're lucky that the Death Eaters are only apparating in this scene and not using their wands because yeah, it allows if they use <laughs> Dumbledore's army to be using their spells on the Death Eaters. Yep, exactly. Uh -huh. So Lucius Malfoy finally corners Harry and all of his friends has been caught. And Lucius is yeah. the one who says, like, did you really think you kids could just fight off the Death Eaters? And right. he's absolutely right. <laughs> My next note was on the confusing black door that Sirius dies in. In the books, I was always so confused about this door. And in the movie, I was still confused about this door. Are you less confused now? It's very no. confusing to me still. Does going I through the door kill door. you? Or is it yes. the spell that killed him? No. Both. <laughs> yeah. What? I looked up this door because I was also very confused by it. And so it turns out... Because she uses it's a Vata Kedavra. Well, okay, well then in the movie, I guess the spell killed him. In the books, I don't know that that's true. The Black Veil is what it's called. If a living person approaches it, the spirits of their loved ones who are dead will basically approach it on the other side and try to talk to them. But you can't hear them. You can just hear some faint mumbling, which is what Harry and Luna hear. And actually in the book, Neville hears it as well. Hermione doesn't, sense. at least in the article I read, because she's an atheist who Whoa. doesn't believe in an afterlife. <laughs> Wait, what? I, I thought, but I thought this that. was a Thestral thing where it's just like if, you, if you've seen death. Yeah. yeah, no, she doesn't believe in an afterlife. So they're can't be souls behind there. <laughs> She's an atheist who believes in magic? <laughs> if you stare at the doorway for too long, you become transfixed and you start to think that the black veil that covers it is beautiful, even though it's old and ratty. And eventually you'll walk through it and die. And if you ever pass through that do doorway, there's no coming back. You'll just okay. die and you're gone. Um, and it right. said that Bellatrix's spell pushed Sirius through the doorway. And that's why he died and why Harry kept thinking he would come back. Why does the ministry have this? Yeah, why so is it it's unguarded? Thing, at least, that's why at least it's lock there. the it's door. It's in the Department of Mysteries because they're yeah, like, behind an what unlocked is door. this thing? It's, <laughs> it's unlocked. There should be a fence around it at least. <laughs> like it's on a pedestal that's inviting you to walk no through it. No one's supposed to go most there. People, it's in the Department of Mysteries. <laughs> most people except for Harry and Luna can't even see that there's anything weird between it. You might just walk through those two pillars. <laughs> yeah, I would if I saw it. <laughs> And this is the part where we get like weird shots of Voldemort showing up and do these weird jump scares and making funny faces, right? Blah. <laughs> Blah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then he has an epic wizard battle with Dumbledore, who also shows up. When Harry is like kind of, I think, on the ground, sort of being controlled by Voldemort, 
the first good memory that snaps Harry out of this is Hermione hugging him. <laughs> yeah, yes. dude. And they only show like three or four memories and about three of them are Emma Watson laughing. <laughs> and the other boys aren't really laughing because apparently they didn't have any good footage of that. No. <laughs> <laughs> we can put the nail in the coffin for the Dumbledore is evil theory though because right here in this scene, Harry looks at Dumbledore and says to him, you're the weak one. You'll never know love <laughs> or friendship. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> Yes, he's Dumbledore definitely is clearly talking to evil. Dumbledore there and not the Voldemort in his head. Oh no, maybe I've misunderstood this scene. <laughs> I think we've all misunderstood all the movies we've ever watched and that's the oh, entire no. reason we have a podcast. Maybe you've actually had directors on before who have told you that you were wrong. Oh, we've also no. had ones that have told us we're right, so ha. <laughs> okay, so the fight is over. Everyone knows Voldemort came back. I just got to unpack Dumbledore's explanation to Harry. He says, I knew it was only a matter of time before Voldemort made the connection between you. I thought by distancing myself from you, as I have done all year, he'd be less tempted and therefore you might get more protected kind of thing. This makes zero sense. If he thought Voldemort might make the connection, he could have just told Harry that. Like, Dumbledore is literally the only person in the world that Voldemort is afraid of. Mm -hmm. Why would distancing well, himself from Harry protect Harry? That doesn't make any sense at all. Voldemort's much more interested with Harry than with Dumbledore anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, like, trying to distance himself won't matter. Harry asks Dumbledore why he didn't tell him about the prophecy. Dumbledore's explanation is to deflect by reminding Harry of his guilt and trauma, saying the same reason you tried to save Sirius. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, you just saying you literally just got oh, Sirius no. killed, just reminding you, hey, man. you're the guilty party here. He's don't don't question He's me. So evil. Yeah, no. Why would I, I and then that saying, whole scene but is then super he says, <laughs> He says, I didn't want to cause you any more pain. I care too much about you, which is <laughs> so clearly causing cause him more pain. pain. <laughs> and then the movie ends with a very nice scene again between Harry and Luna Lovegood, which I really like, where he offers to help her look for all of her things that have gone missing. She says everything, all her things have gone missing <laughs> and she needs to find them by tonight because they're leaving tomorrow. Dude, uh, but and she, he helps her. He finds her. No, she shoes. refuses his help because she's like, oh, things we love her have a way of coming back to us in the end, if not always in the way we expect. And then they look up and see her shoes and she does nothing to get them and says, no, she doesn't go, want go those. have some pudding and skips away. They weren't her shoes. It was someone else's shoes. Oh. <laughs> Uh, and then the movie finally ends with them walking back toward the carriages together. And Harry assures his friends, we got one thing Voldemort doesn't have. And Ron says, what's that? Something worth fighting for. And Ron just looks at him so unimpressed. <laughs> Does not seem <laughs> yeah. like he thinks that's a good reason that at all. Didn't really and the movie ends. Me at all. <laughs> all right. Is Hagrid a Death Eater? Well, yeah. Yeah, Hagrid's a Death Eater. <laughs> Uh, is Dumbledore evil? Is he a dark wizard raising an army? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I, he he, raised, he an raised an army. <laughs> he did specifically do that, yes. <laughs> is Snape Harry's father? I mean, there's been more evidence in this movie than anyone so far. Okay, this is the big one. Is Ron casting Imperius on Hermione? This movie marks a very strong and seemingly sudden change in their relationship from her like clinging to Harry to suddenly her being like, oh, Ron, when that hadn't happened so far. Dude, she doesn't jump out of her chair and go launch herself at Harry when he comes in on Christmas. That oh, is the most true. out of character yeah. thing she's ever done. <laughs> she's clearly under a curse. No yeah. way that could happen normally. We'll see how many uh, more episodes we get out of this. Yeah. <laughs> Two. All right. Come back next yeah. time for possibly more Harry Potter. If you like this theory, if you want to talk to us, we're always on Twitter. So uh, tweet us at Popcorn Isn't Real. Let us know what you think. Uh, let us know if you have any other movies you want us to cover. Uh, we love fan theories. We'd love to talk to you about them. Um, thanks so much, Brita, for being on the podcast today. Really appreciate it. I think you bring a lot of knowledge of the Harry Potter universe. Thanks for having me. Music for this episode was provided by Christine. And remember, the popcorn isn't real.